Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we thank you for joining us as we share with you the life of a very special friend of Jesus, a super saint, Margaret Mary Alacoque, through whom our Lord Jesus gave us the promises of his sacred heart. Margaret Mary Alacoque was born in Charol, a farming village about 20 miles from Paray Lumanyal on July the 25th, 1647. Little did her family know when she was born how powerfully the Lord would use her one day, nor did they have any idea that she was to be the instrument he would use to bring about devotion to his sacred heart and the nine first Fridays. Our little future saint was baptized three days after she was born in the little parish church of Charol. Between the ages of four and eight, she spent much time at her grandmother's chateau. The saintly woman taught her the faith, greatly influencing her future walk towards Jesus. At the age of four and a half, Margaret Mary made a vow of perpetual virginity in front of the statue of Our Lady in her godmother's garden. Margaret Mary, first as a child and then as a young adult, spent long hours on her knees adoring our Lord Jesus, present in the Blessed Sacrament in her far-off parish church. She later wrote, Without knowing what it was, I continually felt the need to say these words, O oh my God, I consecrate my purity to you. I did not understand what I had done or what the word vow meant either any more than what chastity meant. My only desire was to hide in some forest. The first nine years of her life were filled with joy and a family steeped in spirituality, praying the rosary and going to Mass together. But this was to come to a devastating end when her father died. After his death, her whole family was left under the control of her father's brother. As their home was jointly owned by her father and her uncle, Margaret Mary, her mother, and two brothers were forced into a life of servitude, their uncle taking over control of the property, his family treating them worse than servants. By the grace of God, Margaret Mary was sent away to the poor clairs of Charol, where at age nine she received First Holy Communion. Margaret Mary was strongly influenced by the nuns and the stories they told of the saints at the convent school she attended. Considering all nuns to be saints, she watched them closely, believing if she became a nun, she too would become a saint. This special time was to end for Margaret Mary when at 11 years of age she became ill and had to return to her home. She was struck down by a crippling rheumatism that would confine her to the prison of her bed for the next four years. Bedridden, no sign of relief, recovery seeming hopeless, Margaret Mary prayed to the Virgin Mary. She made a vow if Mother Mary would intercede for her to her son, she would someday become one of her nuns. She was immediately cured. To Margaret Mary, her vow to the Blessed Mother to become a nun meant becoming a nun of the Order of the Visitation, because these nuns were called Daughters of Mary. But nine years elapsed before she even asked for admittance to the Order. What happened to the child who had made a vow to the Lord at four and a half years old and the girl who had made a promise to Mother Mary to become one of her daughters? As with so many of us, she was healed through the intercession of Mother Mary, and then she went about her life enjoying her great health, not paying much attention to, if even remembering, the vows she had made. But God had a plan for her, and he executed it. Margaret Mary had many temptations. A genuine problem was the love that she had for her mother, how close they were. The devil plagued her with this. How will you be able to be separated from your mother, whom you love so tenderly? So Margaret Mary went out socially in obedience to the family and loyalty to her mother. She tried to enjoy herself at the parties she attended, but try as she may, she could not, for that voice within her heart spoke clearly and sternly to his future bride. Our Lord Jesus required much discipline of Margaret Mary. She writes that when she was a teenager trying to please the family, she went to a carnival. She took part in the masquerade and dressed in an ornate costume. Right in the midst of the festivities, Jesus appeared to her, scourged from head to toe, his precious skin hanging helplessly, almost falling away from his body, scarred and bruised, ropes painfully rubbing against his hands. His eyes were hurt as they pierced her heart. He told her that he suffered those wounds and hurts because she had dressed in that fashion, not only because of the worldliness of her attire, but because she had chosen human respect over his divine love. Margaret Mary, to the end of her days, 
considered this one of her greatest sins. Margaret Mary wanted to be a saint. She had read the lives of the saints and thought they had never sinned. Believing herself the greatest sinner, she used many harsh forms of mortification to make up for the sins that she felt she had committed when she had put human cares and acceptance before her Lord's will. Our Lord Jesus came and chastised her, scolding her that she was doing her will and not his, for it was not his desire she practiced these extreme atonements for her sins. He told her she was to remember always that he was the master of her soul, not she. Once Margaret Mary decided that she would enter the convent of the visitation, attacks began with a fury that made all other bouts with the devil seem like child's play. He taunted her with, Poor wretch, you will never persevere. You do not have the stuff to be a holy nun. You and your family will be the laughing stocks of the village when you give up the habit and leave the convent. Although her mother never cried in front of her, Everyone told her that her mother wept every time she spoke of Margaret Mary entering the convent. Well-meaning friends of her mother scolded she would be the cause of her mother's death and that Margaret Mary would have to answer to God for abandoning her. Just as she was about to succumb to the attacks of the enemy and to consider marriage, Mother Mary came to her and scolded her for weakening. Then our Lord came to her and reminded her of her vow to him. One day after she received communion, our Lord showed himself to her as the handsomest, the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most perfect of all spouses. He asked her how, since she had been promised to him since childhood, she could think of going with another. Our Lord showed Margaret Mary a large cross covered with flowers, saying this was the bed prepared for his chaste spouses. He told her the flowers would fall and all that would be left were the thorns which would pierce her so deeply. She would need to summon all her strength from his love to endure the excruciating pain. Rather than run from the prospect of such agony, Margaret Mary wrote she longed more and more to join Jesus in the agony of his passion, to love him and to receive him often in Holy Communion, and to die so that she would finally be united to him in paradise. Oftentimes, we are so delighted with God's gift of roses to us we fail to recognize his gift of thorns. We embrace the bouquet and reject the thorns. Margaret Mary would never cease having problems. Even when her family finally accepted her resolve to become a nun, there was strife. They insisted she enter one religious community of nuns, and she was determined to enter the convent of the visitation. After much struggle, she finally walked through the doors of the convent of the Visitation Sisters at paris le on June 20th, 1671, to begin her life as a religious. During the 10-day retreat in preparation for the ceremony, Margaret Mary was praying in the garden of the convent. Our Lord Jesus appeared to her. He spoke gently, softly, instructing her in the mystery of his passion. It was the beginning of a very intimate relationship between Margaret Mary and our Lord Jesus. He was preparing her for great things. He told her, Here is the wound in my side, so that you can make it your permanent and perpetual dwelling. There you will be able to preserve the robe of innocence in which I have clothed your soul, that you may live henceforth by the life of a God-man, as though you are no longer living, so that I may live perfectly in you. Before the day of the ceremony, Margaret Mary knelt before the Blessed Sacrament and begged the Lord's forgiveness for all the times she had betrayed him. She then offered herself as a sacrificial victim to him, her divine master. In reply, our Lord said, Remember that it is a crucified God you intend to wend. This is why you must conform to him, by bidding farewell to all the pleasures of life, for there will be no more pleasures for you except those of the cross. I belong forever to my beloved. I am forever his slave, his servant and his creature, since he is, since he is all mine and I am his unworthy spouse, Sister Margaret Mary, dead to the world. Everything from God and nothing from me, everything God's and nothing from me, with these words on November the 6th, 1672, having made her vows, Margaret Mary became Sister Margaret Mary, nun, bride of Christ, and future saint. One of the greatest blessings Sister Margaret Mary received after her profession 
was that of now being able to see Jesus, her spouse, to feel him close to her, to hear him more clearly than when she had seen and heard him solely with her heart. She could not bear to turn away from Jesus, even for a moment, with his real presence so visibly before her. Sometimes I wonder, do we truly believe that Jesus' real presence is before us, his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the blessed sacrament, after our priest says the words of consecration? He is present in the tabernacle or exposed in a monstrance. Do we spend an hour with him in Eucharistic adoration? Do we believe? On the vigil of the Feast of the Visitation, Margaret Mary was in choir with the rest of the nuns. They were singing Te Deum. Margaret Mary had a loss of voice. She couldn't sing with them. All at once, the baby Jesus appeared in her arms. Her voice returned, and she sang with the rest in the glory of the Lord. The devil never left Sister Margaret Mary. He made her fall, caused her to drop things, then taunt her, her with, You clumsy fool, you. You never do anything worthwhile. The devil would push her down the stairs and bruise her seriously, but not one bone would be broken. This was a promise the Lord had made to her, and he never goes back on a commitment. The devil would try everything and anything to crush her spirit so totally she would be too weak to relate everything to Mother Superior. He did this, knowing the only way to block his power over her was by her obedience and openness to her superior. When Margaret Mary became mistress of novices, she was overjoyed when she came before her novices, kneeling before an image of the Sacred Heart, which they had made and placed on the altar of the oratory. On another occasion, while the other sisters were present in the yard, Margaret Mary had a vision of the Sacred Heart of Jesus surrounded by seraphic angels. The angels made a pact with Margaret Mary at that time. They would suffer with her. She, in turn, would rejoice with them. This special shrine has been renamed the Yard of the Seraphim. In the Church of the Visitation, behind the right side of the main altar, there is a grill behind which Margaret Mary heard Mass and received Holy Communion. One day she went into ecstasy. Our Lord Jesus, present in the Blessed Sacrament, exposed on the altar, gave her the message of love she was to share with the whole world. He showed her his wounded heart and asked her to establish a feast in honor of his sacred heart. During this revelation, our Lord's sacred heart appeared as a brilliant sun of blinding light whose rays fell directly on her heart. The red-hot flames were so intense, Margaret Mary felt they would reduce her to ashes. He showed her his sacred heart on a throne of flames. His heart, pierced by our sins, was surrounded by a crown of thorns. He told Mary... Margaret Mary, my enemies place a crown of thorns on my head, my friends on my heart. A cross rose from the top of his heart, symbolizing the cross that he carried in his heart from the time of his incarnation, the cross of humiliation, abandonment, rejection, pain, and mockery that he and his sacred humanity would suffer and endure throughout his life up to his death on the cross. When our Lord Jesus showed his precious heart, pierced out of love for us, was he preparing Margaret Mary for his mandate? Tell my children they can soothe my wounded heart through renewed devotion to my sacred heart. Although devotion to the sacred heart was not new in the church, existing in some form or another many saints meditating on our Lord's sacred heart, the Lord chose Margaret Mary to promote this devotion in a way which would touch the hearts of all the faithful. He desired it become an official devotion throughout his church, throughout the world, for all in time in memoriam. Jesus told Margaret Mary he wanted to save mankind from eternal damnation, and he would accomplish this through his sacred heart with its love, mercy, grace, sanctification, and salvation. He requested that she tell his children his heart was to be honored in the form of flesh and the image of his heart, surrounded by a crown with a cross above it, was to be exposed in their homes and on their hearts. He promised that wherever his sacred heart was displayed and honored, he would pour out his graces and provide protection from the enemy. Then Jesus asked Margaret Mary to make a holy hour every Thursday from 11 to midnight, From that time till her death, she made this holy hour, prostrating herself on the floor, sharing our Lord's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane with him. 
Was our Lord trusting her with the hour he had offered to his closest apostles, that precious hour when he suffered shedding blood and tears for the sins and agony of the world? Was he asking this from her as reparation for the, for the sins which so excruciatingly wounded him then and wound him now? Or was it to strengthen her for her way of the cross? When Margaret Mary had protested she was too weak to carry out her master's will, what did he offer her to strengthen her? Reception of Holy Communion as often as obedience would allow and a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament. What is the Lord offering us to strengthen us to do his will, to save his church, to console him in these days of crisis and infamy? Reception of Holy Communion often and to spend a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament. It is always the same, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is with us. Jesus is alive. Jesus is our power and strength, always present to us in the Eucharist. The weapons he gave Margaret Mary in the 17th century are the same he gives us today. God is constant, consistently, faithfully all-giving. In this great revelation, Jesus gives us two ways to express our love for him and to make reparation for those who do not. First, to receive Holy Communion often, especially on the first Friday of the month. He asks us to spend a holy hour with him, especially on Thursday evening. After this revelation, the nuns found Margaret Mary unconscious. Seeing she was so weakened physically, not able to walk or talk, they carried her to the Mother Superior. Imagine the Superior's predicament. On one hand, she knew that Margaret Mary was virtuous, but she had misgivings, having an ongoing problem with all the phenomena that had occurred in Margaret Mary's life. She thought, oh, not again. Margaret Mary crumbled on her knees before the Mother Superior, seeing her on the floor, burning with fever, trembling uncontrollably, having difficulty sharing what the Lord desired of her. She refused to grant her any of our Lord's requests. Instead, she replied, wielding a strong tongue lashing, heaping humiliation upon disbelief, forbidding her to, dis- to comply with any of her claimed decrees by the Lord, Margaret Mary obeyed. Now, this must have been horrendous for Margaret Mary. She knew this was the Lord and his wishes, but as with the mystics and saints before her, she obeyed her superiors. Margaret Mary became seriously ill, so debilitated it came to her superior mother's attention. She became alarmed. She had an idea. This would solve all her questions. She turned to Margaret Mary. Why don't you ask God to cure you? In this way, we'll know if this comes from the Holy Spirit. Then I will grant you permission to receive communion on First Fridays, allow your Thursday evening hour vigils. I'll allow everything. As she was to obey her superior in all things, she asked the Lord to heal her. Our Lady, along with her angels, appeared to Margaret Mary. She embraced her and said, Take courage, my dear daughter, in the health I give you in the name of my divine Son, for you have still a long and painful road to travel, always bearing the cross, pierced with nails and thorns, and lacerated by whips. But have no fear, I shall not abandon you, and I promise to protect you. Margaret Mary was restored to perfect health immediately, the sign her superior accepted as proof that her messages were of the Lord. But the battle was not over. A mother superior judged wisely that Margaret Mary needed a strong spiritual director to guide her and to discern the messages she was receiving. Christ had promised her that his work would triumph in spite of his enemies, and he kept his promise by sending a loyal son, a Jesuit priest highly reputed for his wisdom, to his little servant. He sent Father Claude Colombier, who saw the holiness of Margaret Mary and believed in her revelations. Now, Father Claude was not to have Margaret Mary's complete trust and openness in the beginning, until one day, as she was confessing to Father Claude, she heard a voice inwardly tell her, Here is the one I am sending you. After Father Claude had heard all the nuns' confessions and the black cloth was drawn aside, he was able to see all the nuns on the other side of the grill. He looked right at Margaret Mary and said to the Mother Superior, That is a soul of grace. With this, her superior had no more misgivings and offered Margaret Mary to reveal everything to Father Claude. 
As she learned to trust her confessor, Father Claude, more and more, she experienced more and more peace and tranquility. There was, however, still much suspicion and mistrust among the other nuns who could not accept that which they did not know. Having a visionary in their house was tantamount to having the devil himself in their midst. They even resorted to dousing Margaret Mary with holy water. This anger and furor, furor would continue even after her death. After Father Claude was to share in the agony with Margaret Mary, he was also to share in the ecstasy. When we speak of the heart of Jesus, his most sacred heart, are we not speaking of our Lord in the Eucharist, the heart of our church? Our Lord always came and revealed the great revelations to St. Margaret Mary during the sacrifice of the Mass. It was after the consecration that Jesus united his heart with her heart and that of Father Claude. It was then he gave her the image of his sacred heart. Father Claude directed Margaret Mary to write down all that Jesus told her. Although she found this greatly distasteful, not wanting to draw attention to herself, she did so out of obedience. Then she burned all she had written as soon as she was finished. In this way, she thought she had fulfilled the requirements of obedience set down by Father Claude. But when she confessed this, he forbid her to burn her writings. Our Lord came shortly after in June 1675 and revealed to Margaret Mary the fourth and last great revelation. It was the Eucharist. Jesus told Margaret Mary that although there are those who love and adore him, there are those who return his unconditional love, which vulnerably comes to them in the Eucharist with coldness and indifference. He said, I ask you that the first Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi be set aside for a special feast in honor of my heart. By receiving communion that day and by making solemn reparation and honorable amends to make good the insults that it receives when it is exposed on the altars. I promise you that my heart shall deign to shed abundantly the influence of its divine love upon those who render it this honor and induce others so to honor it. It would take ten years before the Feast of the Sacred Heart would be instituted in the Monastery of the Visitation where the revelations took place, and this because Father Claude Colombier had suggested they do so. Now, Father Claude had died in 1682. As God would have it shortly after his death, his book, Spiritual Retreat, was published. He had been so moved by Jesus' last great revelation to Margaret Mary, he took what she had written with him when he left for England and later included this message from the Lord at the end of his book, Spiritual Retreat. As Father Claude had always been considered holy and his teachers re teachings reliable, the nun in charge of choosing the readings for the refectory never bothered reading the book of the day ahead of time. Toward the end of the book, Father Claude was sharing his experience before the Blessed Sacrament, how his heart would overflow on the point of bursting with an elation and joy from the Lord he did not understand himself. His words not only touched the nuns, but Margaret Mary herself, as she recalled the experiences she shared with the Lord and her deceased spiritual brother, Claude Colombier. The nun continued reading. Near to finishing the book, she came to Margaret Mary's account of the last great revelation, the realization that the one whose writings were being read was their own Margaret Mary caused excitement to spread throughout the refectory. Margaret Mary had waited 10 years for this moment. At last, devotion to the Sacred Heart would spread and spread throughout the church as her Savior had commanded. Our Lord Jesus predicted the day of her death. On the evening of October the 17th, 1690, Margaret Mary commended her soul to her Savior. Her tomb is in the Church of the Visitation at the right of the main altar. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart. Jesus had loved God with his whole heart. Margaret Mary had loved Jesus with her whole heart. And so at last she was able to plunge herself into the heart of her Savior those were her last words. Margaret Mary is buried in the Church of the Visitation. Her body can be found at the right of the main altar, where our Lord had appeared to her many times in the 19 years she lived as a nun in that community. The revelations from our Lord Jesus were not only accepted by the Church, but because of the virtuous, selfless life of this nun, she was raised to the communion of saints in 1920. 
Margaret Mary has drawn people from all over Europe to come to the shrine. The charismatic movement of Europe holds their meetings there every year, and a beautiful youth group every year comes to paris le Moniel to have a, a youth conference at the shrine of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. On one of her visions, our Lord invited Margaret Mary and St. Claude to envelop their hearts inside his heart, and he burned away everything that was not of them, and only one heart appeared, and that was his. Enter the heart of Jesus. <laughs> 